Welcome to our um, iNaturalist webinar. Um, this is actually this is a topic that's garnered a lot of interest um, based on the numbers and the people that have registered. So I'm happy that we're able to um, to bring this to you, and I'm also excited to to hear about this as well. Um, so um, this webinar and others that we've delivered are being recorded. We've had a few questions about that before the webinar. Um, anybody who's signed up uh, will receive an email with the recording. Um, and you can view this one as well as others um, that you can check out on our website as well. Um, if you uh, Google CWF webinars, um, you can find it that way. And or um, uh, I will drop a link to that in the chat uh, once I'm done speaking anyway. Um, so this webinar, as well as others that we've delivered on iNaturalist and other uh, topics are found on that website. Um, we actually also have one coming up next week if you're interested in bats, um, exploring the uh, mysterious world of bats as we lead up to Halloween. Um, that'll be October 25th uh, at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Um, first of all, I would like to begin by uh, acknowledging that the land from which the Canadian Wildlife Federation is located and where I live, work, and play is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. Um, the Algonquin people have inhabited and cared for these um, lands long before today, and so we take this time to be very grateful for the care, um, for their care and uh, show our gratitude and respect to them and the land uh, for all that it provides us. Um, I'm James Page. I'm the Species at Risk and Biodiversity Specialist at Canadian Wildlife Federation, um, along with Acacia Frimpong Manso, who is uh, my colleague at CWF. We will be hosting this webinar um, and I will introduce Sean, our, our main presenter, uh, at the end of my little intro spiel here. So first of all, um, a couple of logistics. A few of you are, are posting in the chat, which is great, um, but only uh, the presenters. So Acacia, myself, and Sean will be able to see those. Um, we're reserving that just for technical issues if you're having sound problems um, or can't hear properly or anything like that. So that'll just come to the three of us so we can help guide you through that. Um, if you are having problems, first and foremost, with audio or video, check your audio settings, make sure Zoom has access to your speakers, or headphones. Um, typically, if that seems all normal, if you leave the webinar and don't rejoin using the same link you got here with, um, that often fixes things, it resets um, as well. Um, for the questions, um, you can type it into the Q&A, which you'll see depending on your computer, it'll be either at the top bar or the bottom bar. Um, you please put them in as we go so that they're fresh in your mind and we will compile them and uh, ask them to Sean toward at the end. Um, and if there's some kind of simple ones that Casey and I can, uh, can also type in some answers as we go. Um, we do have the setting for those who are hearing impaired. You can click the live transcription um, that you'd see uh, in the toolbar um, to show subtitles. Um, no guarantees on how well this works. This is kind of auto um, written through the platform, um, but it is there as an option. Uh, so a little bit about Canadian Wildlife Federation. Uh, we're one of Canada's uh, largest conservation organizations undertaking projects in conservation and research across the country um, and across some key focus areas, which you can see on this uh, the slide are some of our focal areas. Um, our mission is to conserve and inspire the conservation of wildlife and habitats for use and enjoyment of all. Um, we do this by a number of ways, but one of which is through community science, which is going to be part of the focus of our discussion and what Sean's, Sean's going to talk about how uh, we can capture those um, great photos. And uh, I'm going to tie that into how um, iNaturalist uh, plays in as well. So as far as community science goes as well, um, CWF is the lead in the creation and management of iNaturalist in Canada. Um, we have help from our partners at Parks Canada and NatureServe Canada. Um, and which iNaturalist Canada is part of a global iNaturalist network um, run by iNaturalist.org um, out of the United States. They, um, there are now about 20 countries that have their own version of iNaturalist like we do here in Canada. And this is kind of what the data looks like, the hotspot of where all the observations come from across the world. These all feed into the global iNaturalist.org database, which has uh, 60, 160 million observations around the world. We here in Canada have about 12 million observations. Um, and this data is you know, more than just taking fun photos and, and sharing, it's um, going towards conservation. So the database is open for anybody to, to um, view. So you know, for conservation and education, I should say. Um, so anybody can access the database, browse through, look at what's in their neighborhood. 
Um, but the data is also then specifically shared for uh, researchers and conservation organizations as well to undertake um, research and, and work um, on habitats and species. Um, the data for, from people who affiliate with iNaturalist Canada, as I mentioned, there's 20 different countries. If and, and each, you, any user can affiliate with one of those countries. Um, if you check your account settings just to, to make sure if you're affili affiliated with iNaturalist Canada, it allows us to share data more easily for that conservation work. Um, another reason why we have this in Canada is it's bilingual, um, and we also have Canadian specific resources, and the, the platform is catered to us here in Canada. Um, I wanted to just kind of lead in with Sean's presentation with a, uh, an example from my naturalist um, and why it's valuable to make sure we do get decent photos. Um, this is a great observation to have. Um, this, you know, it has a location, it has a photo. Um, the person that took the observation said it's a confirmed location of this species, um, but it doesn't allow anybody else to confirm that or verify that. So, um, you know, if the, the better the photo is, the better we can actually identify and confirm that species, which then can be better used for conservation work. So, you know, ideally, we would get one like this. Not everybody's going to get a photo that looks like this, which is understandable. But even something like this that is, you know, in the same species, still far away, but at least it's in focus. You can see the markings on the wings and someone else can, has been able to go in and, and confirm the identification of this, um, this storm petrol. Um, so something to help along with that is we've created some resources in iNaturalist, which can be found through the help uh, page or the resources page, if you can find that as well on iNaturalist.ca. Um, this kind of helps get, provide tips on how to take pictures to capture, not necessarily the best photo, but I'll at least capture the best identification features of that species. So the, the kind of things to look out for what you want to make sure you capture in a photo that will allow it to be better identified. So again, this is in the help section of iNaturals.ca, along with some other um, uh, tools, um, guides, as well as recordings of some webinars like this. And so with that, I will introduce um, Dr. Sean Landsman, who is uh, an instructor at Carleton University, uh, cross-appointed -appoint in the Institute of Environmental and Interdisciplinary Sciences, as well as the Biology Department. And in, in addition to working with students at Carleton, Dr. Landsman is an award-winning photographer with a focus on nature photography, uh, and most especially underwater photography. As a science communicator, Dr. Landsman believes strong imagery has the power to create change that sometimes text cannot, and uh, strongly encourages people to connect with nature by photog photographing it. And with that, I will turn it over to Sean. Great, thanks, James. Um, uh, let me get my computer all set up here. So, should be good to go there, James Acacia. Yeah, that? it looks perfect. Okay, great, excellent. Yeah, well, thank you uh, for the invitation to to speak to everyone today. Um, when I, I heard of the uh, the number of registrants, I, I had a little moment of of panic. Um, cause this is a, this is a tricky topic to, to talk about, uh, with as many people, uh, as have registered for, for this webinar in part, because, um, you know, everyone's got a different camera. Some, you know, don't have necessarily have a, a camera and may just have a phone, but even if you have a phone, this is an iPhone, but others have, you know, a, a Google Pixel or a Samsung, um, a Huawei, all sorts of other phones out there, right? So, um, so, so coming up with a list of things that um, could be broadly applicable to everybody, regardless of what kind of camera you have, was a bit of a challenge, but... Um, but but one that I took on, and and so hopefully uh, you you will all walk away with something today, having uh, have, having learned something new, or having um, uh, given yourself a kind of pause for for thought and things to consider for the future. Um, yeah. So first, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about gear lust and gear acquisition syndrome, or or gas, which is this strong, often overwhelming desire to purchase new camera gear. And I think one of the, the biggest myths out there is that in photography, it's not the camera that makes the photographer. You know, you, you hear sometimes uh, compliments like, uh, oh, wow, your camera takes beautiful pictures. 
Um, when in reality, it's not really the camera that took the picture, but it was the person's brain that that came up with the composition and got down at the right angle and used you know the lighting to their advantage uh, to help them take a really captivating image. Um, I also think sometimes that, that social media can sometimes feed this problem um, and, uh, and photography blogs and, and websites. So I say all this to encourage you that it doesn't matter what camera you have. In fact, quite frankly, um, I find myself taking my large DSLR camera out less and less and less and just using my, uh, my iPhone, which has a perfectly capable camera in it, and has some really interesting features in it that allow me to get really unique uh, photos. In fact, this summer, um, I have a couple of grad students working on a, uh, a project in Algonquin Park on the Petawawa River, and we're working out of a fairly small inflatable boat. There's three people, there's gear, there's not a lot of room for my camera bag, um, not to mention it's it's often super wet. I don't really want to put my camera bag down in a giant puddle. Um, so I would just take my phone out, and I just got really familiar with the capabilities of my camera on my phone, and that allowed me to take some really interesting pictures. Okay. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, more in a bit. The first thing to, uh, to, to note is that cameras are really just tools. And I'll tell you a little bit of, more about myself and my interests. I really enjoy uh, woodworking. And, and while I, I no longer really engage in sort of photography gear lust, uh, I, I definitely find myself pining away for new woodworking tools, new routers, new saws, hand planes, jointers, thicknesses, all that stuff. Um, there's a lot of ways to cross cut a piece of wood. Um, there's also lots of ways to take really great portraits of birds or anything really else in, in, in nature. Um, and it's really important for us to remember that cameras are simply tools. Um, and like all tools, they each have their limitations. So I wouldn't necessarily reach for uh, a hand file to cross cut a piece of wood, but I could probably cross cut a piece of wood with a hacksaw if I wanted to, um, if I didn't have anything else on hand. And so with a bit of care, that cut should turn out fine. And the same principle holds in photography. You can take a picture of just about anything out there as long as you understand the limitations of what you're working with uh, and then adjust accordingly to get the best image possible. And so, again, we'll talk a little bit more about capabilities and limitations of, uh, of whatever camera you're using in a bit. The image that you see here um, on the screen uh, is was taken by Dr. Tim LeMann. Um, and it won him the Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition in 20, uh, grand title competition in 2016. And I mean, the image itself is, it sort of speaks for itself. It's this unbelievably amazing perspective and image of this orangutan coming up this, this giant tree trunk and you see the canopy down below it. And, you know, you can tell you're really high up. Um, but perhaps what's most remarkable about this image is that he didn't use Canon or Nikon or Sony's flagship cameras. He didn't use, you know, the, you know, a $3,000 super wide angle lens. Uh, if those of you that are familiar with this, with, with this picture might, might know already that this photo was taken with a $500 GoPro Hero 4 that he uh, mounted in the tree to get this perspective. And a $500 camera for someone as, uh, as as experienced as as Tim LeMann is, um, he shoots for National Geographic and has you know a, a myriad of different um, uh, photo credits to his uh, to his resume. Um, you know this is a pretty inexpensive camera, and uh, yet he pulled off the sort of the well, not for the Oscars of wildlife photography as they call them. So really remarkable image, but he just recognized that he needed a particular tool for the job, and so remember. Cameras are just tools. Um, I'd say that the number one tip that I have for everybody um, is to just know your subjects. Now, some of us, when we're just going out and about and making iNaturalist observations, we're not necessarily going into nature or going outside with the expectation of encountering something specific. Maybe we are, maybe we are in search of something, 
but knowing a bit about your subjects ahead of time, including what might be in the area, can be really useful for helping inform how we approach taking images of those particular subjects, particularly images that can be used for identification purposes later on. So knowing your subject is really important uh, ahead of time. And uh, you know, understanding a bit about the biology and ecology of what might be in that area, or if you're looking for something very specific, like a bird, for example, um, knowing a bit about you know when they're most active at certain times of the day, what habitats they prefer to be in at particular times of the year can all be really informative for putting yourself in the right place at the right time to take the best image possible that has uh, the most utility on something like uh, iNaturalist. Um, as an example of, uh, of how I approached knowing a little more about a subject and thus then allowing that to inform how I was able to capture really, uh, really captivating images of, of particularly a behavior. Um, when I did my PhD or started doing my PhD on Prince Edward Island in 2013, um, I did not know a whole lot about brook trout. I'm from the cornfields of Illinois. Um, originally, and there's not a lot of trout species in Illinois, much less brook trout. Um, and so when I arrived on Prince Edward Island, although I had worked in Lake Michigan and had worked with different salmonid species, brook trout was not one of them. And so when I arrived on Prince Edward Island, after a few years, I ended up getting a, an underwater housing for my camera. Uh, I wanted to capture images of brook trout that few had captured prior. Um, and nobody had captured on, on Prince. Yes. Um, hey, sorry. Uh, a couple of people said your your volume is kind of phasing up higher and lower. Like we can hear you, but it's uh, it's jumping a okay. little bit. Let Are me, you able uh, to maybe switch do... to your computer audio? I'm going to switch to my computer audio. Yeah, I just okay. have to grab the case for the for this, and we'll put these away. Thanks for letting me know that because I want to make sure that everyone. No problem. Yeah, it seemed okay when the three of us were talking beforehand, but uh, maybe with the extra bandwidth, it's jumping a little bit. Okay, can everyone hear me? Can you hear me, James? Yeah, actually, that's sounding that better. Quite good. Yeah, thanks. Uh, James, can you hear me? Yeah. Are you not getting audio? We're hearing you. How's that? Good. Sounds good. good. Okay. Robert says, sounds good. Okay. Hopefully everyone can hear loud and clear. All right. Excellent. I'm having no issue with audio volume at all. Okay, great. So um, I will continue here. So um, I didn't know anything about brook trout spawning behaviors. I really wanted to capture those brook trout spawning behaviors. So I just went to the literature and I started looking around and started accessing freely available information online. Um, and was able to, uh, to, to find a really informative paper that helped put me in a position to make decisions about how uh, I would capture images and, and what kinds of images of their behavior I wanted to capture. So I would leverage the power of Google and see what you can find. You even might consider leveraging the power of AI these days. Check out ChatGPT. See if you can get yourself caught up to speed on you know really important elements of a species biology and ecology. So, um, so that would be that would be one suggestion I would make. Another suggestion I'd make is to talk to biologists. Um, biologists are a bunch of nerds. Um, I'm one of I can say that because I am a biologist and a nerd. Um, but yeah, seriously, engage with folks that have knowledge about the subjects you're seeking or knowledge about the uh, locations that you'll be going to. More, time, more often than not, um, biologists would be more than happy to share with you information that they, uh, that they know about. Um, it's rare that a biologist would withhold information unless we're talking about situations where you know, a biologist might um, have some concerns about, you know, disturbance to a particular species at risk um, and or its its habitat. But generally speaking, uh, most biologists want to share with the public 
um, and interested parties what they know about a particular ecosystem or, uh, or its inhabitants. Another um, suggestion I would make too is to, to try and study the weather, moon, and and space. So if you're interested in in making you know particular images that um, uh, of of nature or uh, or or particular critters creatures that might be more active at certain times of the year, certain weather patterns, certain moon phases, um, then you may you may want to look into how weather can impact that. Um, from just like a purely aesthetic standpoint, um, understanding how weather patterns can affect the, the mood or feeling of an image um, can, uh, can be useful in terms of like uh, increasing the aesthetic appeal uh, of your imagery. So becoming a student of, of weather, um, being able to maybe predict how uh, a weather system might be moving into an area and how animals uh, might be influenced by that. For example, like, you know, recent rain events in, in the spring that fill up vernal pools might become uh, important for drawing things like salamanders and, and other amphibians to those vernal pools. And so if you're following the weather patterns, and you see, we get a we get a you know a, a bump in precipitation at a particular time of year. You might seek going out into certain locations where where looking for things like salamanders is uh, is something that you're interested in doing. And 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 again, if you live on like the coast or something, paying attention to tide cycles. Uh, there's different cycles. There's spring tides. There's neap tides. Um, and tide cycles for coastal dwelling organisms um, are a major driver in behavior. So becoming a student of the weather, moon, and space can be uh, can be really advantageous for for you. Um, one really practical thing I would suggest that everyone do is spending time understanding what your camera's capabilities or limitations are. Um, is really critical for understanding what images you can and cannot take. So uh, things like the minimum focusing distance, uh, image quality when zoomed in. So that that one um, that one photo that James put up earlier, I think it was a storm uh, petrel. Um, you know that was it looked like it was zoomed in substantially, but also looked like it was kind of cloudy out. And sometimes if you're using a camera that uses optical zoom, uh, that can be problematic for getting good crisp pictures. And then things that are in the distance can be uh, can become like kind of blurry. And so for creatures like the storm's petrel, um, you uh, you may lose uh, you may lose some of those identifying uh, features. Um, image quality at high ISOs. So if you are in a dark area and you need to bump up the ISO on your camera or use another you know feature on your on your iPhone that controls for the sensitivity of light coming into the camera sensor, um, just be aware that at uh, really high ISO values, when your camera is really being very sensitive to light, you can uh, you can get some uh, kind of artifacts that appear in your images. And if we're talking about um, an animal, trying to identify an animal that has very small details, uh, those may become obscured at those really high uh, ISOs. So keep that in mind. Perspective or distortion with lenses. You know, if you're using like a real super wide angle lens, that can be kind of problematic um, for uh, for for distorting certain features. Uh, of of a of a creature, a little critter that uh, that you're trying to photograph, um, getting sharp photos. I mean, you know, no no better way to ruin a photo than to get a blurry image of something, and then you know it becomes kind of useless to 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 everybody, yourself included, in terms of um, how you use it. So trying to understand what minimum shutter speed is required to take sharp photos um, is is pretty clear, uh, pretty key. Um, if you've got like a little bit more of a complicated camera, even something like a point and shoot, um, digging into the camera's menus to teach yourself how your camera works and what different functions might be available to, to you. For example, like 
an auto ISO feature on a camera or something uh, might be helpful for understanding, oh, I actually have this tool I can use in certain situations. I should keep that in mind next time I'm out. If it's like super cloudy out, I can, you know, turn on the auto ISO feature and that can help me compensate for, for differing light levels and allow me to reach a minimum shutter speed that I know is required to take sharp photos. Okay, so dig into your camera menus. Um, lens flare as well. So if you're shooting into the sun, um, some cameras and some camera sensors will handle uh, that kind of a situation where you're shooting into the sun better than others. Um, and so having an awareness of, oh boy, I am like pointed directly at the sun. This is going to cause crazy amounts of, of lens flare. And that lens flare may distort the colors of whatever I'm taking a photo of, or may distort some other aspect of whatever I'm taking an image of. Um, I maybe need to just move my body or take a hat if you've got it. And sometimes just using your hat to kind of block out the sun will allow you to reduce or eliminate lens flare. So just a kind of experimenting. Really the key is just taking whatever camera that you typically shoot with um, and just experimenting with it. Um, so for example, I've used small objects around my house to push the limits of my own phone to see what you know certain images look like. And not only my phone, but, but other um, other of my camera gear, my my DS my high end DSLR stuff. For those that are really into bird photography, one thing I thought of is you could take a, a bird Christmas tree ornament and actually go hang it in a tree in your backyard, and then grab your camera, whatever camera you're using, and now experiment with okay, how close do I need to be to get a like a pretty clear image of the feathers and other identifying features. So that you know, okay, I really need to be, you know, at least this close to my subject to be able to get good images. You could experiment with cropping and step way back, take a picture with your camera, bring it back to your computer and do a very aggressive crop and see, okay, how, how far back can I be and how tightly can I crop and still maintain good image quality such that I can see lots of uh, lots of detail. Because sometimes if you crop too heavily, um, you you end up losing a lot of detail. So just experiment. That's would be one of the, the things you should take away from this presentation today is do not be afraid to experiment. Okay, some other tips um, are to learn perspective. Some of the images that James flashed early on in, in, uh, in his preamble um, showed some really great images uh, that are were both like technically looked very good, um, but also from the perspective of showcasing the actual animals were really great. One I think was a Blanding's turtle, and that I noticed was taken down from the ground, kind of at eye level. And so one of the features of the Blanding's turtle is that yellow that yellow throat. Now, if you were standing and looking at that uh, at that turtle from above, you might actually in photographing it might actually miss that really key identifying feature. So try and think about getting down on the um, lower to the ground and almost um, take, a, take a photo like you're from the perspective of the animal itself. Okay, so in this case is a piping plover um, from Prince Edward Island. And I was laying flat with my belly on the ground to take a picture of, uh, of this little chick. These are American eels, and you can see the photo on the left. You can see I'm a little bit above it, and it doesn't quite have the same appeal as the photo on the right. So I was floating kind of at the surface of the water, um, and the photo on the left, I basically extended my arms at, down as far as I could, but I didn't kick down to the bottom. And I realized that I wanted to get a slightly different angle where the camera was much lower to the to the sea floor. Um, and so I kicked down to the bottom and turned my camera up. And as I did that, the uh, the American eel actually came in to expect, inspect its reflection on the camera. But getting that slightly more um, uh, parallel uh, eye level um, perspective on the on on the eel, I think made a much more captivating image. It feels like I'm another eel looking at that eel on the right 
as opposed to maybe being more of like a human snorkeling, looking down at an eel, um, which is kind of the feeling I get when I look at the one on the left there. Uh, something else is to learn lighting. And so learn how lighting can impact um, the, uh, the, the, the feel of an image. So you'll notice this, this photo on the right um, of this gray seal uh, pup on Prince Edward Island. Um, was taken kind of in the middle of the of the day, or at least like kind of mid after mid afternoon, and that light is pretty flat. Now, one thing about that image that that does um, I think that think go for it as a kind of like more of like an eye naturalist observation is you can see a lot of the markings really well, and the way I had positioned my body is that. Um, uh, the shadows weren't being cast in in all the wrong places. So it's actually illuminated really nicely, but it is kind of flat and it, and it kind of lacks a bit of depth. The, the photo on the left is uh, of a pup taken in the evening. And um, you can see there, there's, you know, it's that golden hour, right? There's a nice kind of warm feel to the image. Um, there's some, there's a bit of texture and uh, and shadow. Um, and you can still make out some of the good uh, the good identifying features of it. But that would be an example where um, understanding how lighting can impact a photo can take you know a pretty decent photo and elevate it up to to something just a little bit uh, nicer and more pleasing to look at. Um, one thing that I uh, started doing this summer, particularly with uh, my students out, uh, in the on the Petawawa River in Algonquin was I actually started using uh, an external light source. It was just a, I don't know if anyone's familiar with these Dakota lithium power boxes. Um, they're uh, they're they're a small they're a small box that contains a little uh, lithium ion battery in it. And one of the features of this little power box, in addition to being able to charge devices and stuff, is it has a really powerful light source. And so I um, I turned this light source on. In the evening, when my students were were doing a uh, a surgery on a muskie, we were putting a transmitter in this fish, and I had that the the light source initially. I had it kind of in between my legs, pointed at them. But I but I I I when I looked at that image, I thought, you know what? I'm not sure that I really like the feel of this image. It looks like there's just not enough shadow, and I think if I move that light source off to the side. I can get a pretty good image of what I want to showcase here. And what I realized is that off sort of off camera lighting was really helpful in illuminating the scene better. Um, and what I would suggest is that if any of you are going out into the woods or into any other environment um, in the evening or, or later, even at night, um, definitely bring a secondary light source with you. And if you've got a second person, uh, all the better. Because if you've got the camera, you can give the secondary light source to uh, to a friend and they can then illuminate the scene or whatever it is that you might be looking at and trying to photograph uh, much better. Direct light on a subject can be really harsh and you can get just like a kind of a flat look to everything lots of harsh shadows. Um, if you get your light source off to the sides, you can take images that um, are, are a little bit more appealing, not to mention illuminate texture and things that might be important to include in something like an iNaturalist observation. Okay, the next little bit here, I'm gonna talk, uh, talk somewhat about um, composition. And um, some of these tips are gonna be geared for those you know looking to to improve their photography in general. But some of these tips will also be useful for, um, for you if you're trying to make uh, iNaturalist observations. So one of those first images that James showed was of a warbler and um, uh, it had a very nice blurred background. And um, one way that you can, or one advantage of blurring the background is that it helps isolate the subject. It makes it very clear what it is you're looking at um, when you you can't your mind doesn't want to your eye doesn't want to focus on a blurry you know blurry background or blurry for, foreground elements. It's going to want to focus on the thing that's sharp and in focus. So here's uh, you know here's a picture of a yellow warbler. Um, I was trying to get a good angle on it, and there happened to be some 
uh, some some flowers that were in bloom. Um, and I was able to frame, find a little gap and, and frame the yellow warblers uh, sitting on this tree branch um, between a couple of fronds of this of this plant that was was flowering. Just so happened the plant was yellow and sort of kind of matches uh, the, the yellow uh, plumage on the bird. Um, but the blurred foreground element along along with the blurred background element, helps focus the eye on the bird itself there. Because you'll notice that a lot of the branch is uh, is in focus as, as well. So if those yellow flowers hadn't been there, that might be a little bit of uh, a distracting element with those other clear, sharp elements of the branch. Leading lines are another good, uh, just a good compositional technique here. And so you can see the stream um, is originating on the bottom right of the image, and then you kind of follow it going upstream, and you see it sort of curving into the background there. So leading lines are important to consider. Uh, symmetry, if you're taking a you know a scene of of, of habitat or uh, or even an image of a bird, um, having some symmetry. If the bird is on like the edge of a, a shoreline and the the water body is really flat, calm you can get some really nice um, symmetry via reflections in the water. So thinking about symmetry um, is, is a good tip. And of course, probably all of us are, are familiar with the concept of the rule of thirds. Um, here in this image of a greater yellow legs, um, this is combining the, the rule of thirds as well as that left to right rule, where our eyes are really trained to process information from left to right. And so images that go from right to left look a little bit off. And part of that reason is because we're used to seeing things presented in a left to right fashion. Filling the frame. Um, so if you're taking images of plants, for example, get up close and get tight. Another advantage of that is the closer you can get, as long as you're not too close, is you're, you're going to get a lot more detail. Um, but the aesthetically, it's going to look really nice if you can fill that frame. One, uh, one, one element of filling the frame like this is it gives the impression of, um, uh, of many of you know, these plants being very numerous. So you, can actually, you could actually take a relatively small clump of flowers or plants or insects or whatever, fill the frame with it such that parts of whatever it is you're shooting bleed off of the frame and give the impression that there's actually lots of them there. Okay, so that's a tip. Um, waiting for that decisive moment. Um, going back to the example of the petrel earlier, um, and it had there one of the images that James showed was the bird had opened its wings, and it showed in the picture. Even the picture, though the picture wasn't the maybe the best portrait of that of that species, the photographer had waited for its wings to open so that you could see the markings on the wings, which would be characteristic of that bird. Now, if the bird is just sitting there on the water with its wings folded and they take a picture of that bird and then upload it to, um, to, uh, to iNaturalist, then it has relatively little value, but they waited and waited and waited. Then the bird opened its wings, boom, they hit the shutter and they captured an important identifying element of that bird. And so waiting for that decisive moment is really key. And part of that is knowing a little bit about what you're looking at and so it goes back to that know your subject thing. Um, one element too that's really important for everybody is that you need to learn how to self-critique. And of course, be gentle with yourselves, um, but learn to look at an image and go, you know what, that just doesn't quite do it. And this is an image um, that I would say doesn't quite do it. And there's a couple of things wrong. This is one of my images. Um, and uh, the goal, ha it, you can see that the white plumage, its white feathers are pretty blown out. They're, they've lost detail, particularly like in the back of the head and down toward the tail. Um, but also it violates that left to right rule. Now I could have flipped this image in post-processing, that would be totally fine. Um, but this was the original orientation of the image and it just doesn't quite, eh, it's moving right to left. I mean, sometimes it's kind of out of our control, but learning to self-critique critique will make you a better photographer moving forward and will lead to better iNaturalist observations. Another thing to, uh, to do as well is actually learn a little bit how uh, psychology can influence how we perceive imagery. 
Um, you know, as as an academic, I like sort of going down little rabbit holes and 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 looking at, especially as an interdisciplinary um, uh, scientist. I like to look at different fields and try and draw information from different fields to help, you know, inform uh, myself of things. And uh, understanding a little about, bit about psychology, although not my field, has actually been really useful for uh, making compositional decisions when I'm actually in the field to create more captivating and interesting images to look at. Um, as an example, uh, Gestalt's uh, principles of perception is one example of how the field of psychology can help us as photographers. So there's about six of Gestalt's principles or laws of perception. I'm only gonna talk about three of them here for the sake of time, um, but figure ground is, uh, is, really, is really key. So here in this particular principle, the figure or the subject should be separate from the ground and that can be the foreground or the background. Um, and so busy for or background elements make it confusing for viewers to, to, to decipher what it is they're supposed to be looking at. It just adds more cognitive load to those that are looking at images. And so for the, in the case of this melanistic um, red fox photographed on Prince Edward Island, um, I knew that I didn't really want to get any uh, any of the of the snowy background. I kind of wanted a bit of a high key look, as they call it. Um, but that had the advantage of focusing the viewer's attention on the fox itself. And so what I had to do was I had to intentionally expose for the fox. If I had left my camera to sort of auto expose the scene it would have picked up a lot of the really bright snow and tricked the camera into thinking it needed to compensate for that bright snow by increasing the shutter speed, but that would have lost detail in the, in the black fox's coat. And so I would have lost a lot of the appeal of this image. Instead, I actually had to force the camera to, uh, to, to meter, as they call it, off of the black fo off of the, the melanistic fox to in order to retain the detail in its coat. It had the uh, effect of blowing out the background, but I think it works really well here. And uh, at the time I was using a DSLR, but you can do something similar with your, with your, um, with an iPhone, probably with, a, with um, an Android phone as well, and click on the actual subject you're trying to take a photograph of. I think if you click and hold, it should then meter on that subject. And that way then the, the camera exposes properly. So keep that in mind. And in this case, it helps to separate the subject from the background. Uh, there's also another principle called continuance. Um, and this helps explain why leading lines as a compositional technique are, uh, are so important and effective. So viewers, humans, are hardwired to follow paths and images. We are, as a, as a species, really good at finding patterns in everyday things that we look at, including in photos. We're looking for paths. We're looking for ways to make sense of, of what it is we're, we're, we're viewing. Um, so here in this case, um, I wanted to showcase that these fish were moving upstream into this kind of dark and, and scary, in this case, it's a culvert. And so I positioned myself so that the subject was in the bottom right of the frame and the body positioning of the smelt were going from bottom right to top left, leading the viewer toward this ominous black part of the, of the culvert. And so having um, an, an idea of this as a strategy for taking some uh, more captivating images uh, would be useful. So this is, the, this is the principle of continuance. The last principle that I'll talk about is that of common fate. Um, and it's uh, this is a principle where you take a group of, of subjects and you, you put them into your frame um, and they're all going in one direction and they're kind of all leading into one. They all share a common fate. One of the advantages of photographing a, a group of individuals all moving like in the same direction, for example, you know, the V formation of, of Canada geese going south is that our brains then look at that as we look at that and, and say, they're all headed in the same place, cool, and they're all moving together like one unit. 
And so there's there's sort of a couple of psychological things going on that can uh, can elevate uh, an image. If you were to only focus on one individual of a larger group, it might not have as much impact as if you include the um, the larger group. Developing a realistic sh uh, shot list is also important. So this is just a screenshot of some images, some um, sh some some photos that I had um, uh, put together in a list form for. Uh, a photo project I was working on on the East Coast with um, with glass with a glass eel fishery out there, um, and I uh, put these together, and then basically that helped me apportion my time more efficiently in the field. And so, if you're trying to push yourself to be more creative or to to capture really captivating images and things that might be really useful to the broader iNaturalist audience. Coming up with a, a, a shot list is important, but be realistic. Go back to understanding your cap the capabilities of your camera that you're using. Don't try and force a square peg in a round hole. So develop a realistic shot list. The other thing that I would do too um, is to develop photo projects, particularly those that are local photo projects. It doesn't matter what camera you have, but take some time to, um, to explore subjects in your local area that are um, of some importance to you. If you invest time and energy into something that, you're in, that, that you care deeply about, they will, that will lead to the formation of better images. I, I, I guarantee it. You will, push, you will push yourselves to experiment, to try different things and to be more careful and make more um, uh, be more careful with your decisions when you're actually in the field. Um, so you might, you know, choose to, for example, photograph all the bees in your local flower garden and uh, try to, you know, determine what different species are using your flowers in your backyard. Um, you might want to go to your local park or other natural area and photograph all of the, the migrate, as many migrating songbirds as, as possible in the spring to get, um, you know, to, to, to sort of maybe fill some gaps in the eye naturalist observations. Okay, so pushing yourself to create little photo projects is a really great way of increasing your skills. Um, yeah, here's another example. You could go and leverage the power of iNaturalist and filter, you know, by by group of, of species, by family, by genus, by individuals, um, look in specific areas uh, that you might be living in and see what is not present and then challenge yourself to go out and fill in those gaps, but challenge yourself to fill in those gaps with images um, that 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 have you know as as strong an aesthetic uh, quality to them as possible, and thus um, can can act as really good identifying photos to draw from. Another project that that I would encourage all iNaturalists to to get involved with um, is something called the Meet Your Neighbors project. You can find more information about this project by just uh, googling it, and it should take you to a Facebook page. There's some resources online that you can access that will help you um, uh, get started on, in this project. But this is like a global photographic biodiversity initiative. Um, and it involves taking photos of, of creatures uh, in kind of like a field studio setup. The field studio does not have to be fancy. I have made it fancy and complicated because you know, just want to do that to myself, I guess. Um, but it doesn't have to be. The idea is that you take pictures of plants, animals, fungi uh, against a white background. Usually that requires using some kind of light sources to help illuminate and blow out that white background, as well as cast some light on the subject uh, that you're photographing. And um, this can be done, you know, with just a simple sheet of white paper. You can have a couple of flashlights that somebody holds in different in different ways and different distances from the subject and the paper. You can make it as complicated or as simple as you want. But this is a really interesting initiative. It might give people um, some motivation for getting out and exploring the their the world around them. So I wanted to just draw your attention to that last initiative there. And I think at this point, I'm going to go ahead and, and open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. So we have a lot of questions here in the chat. 
So I'll get to some of them. Um, the first question we have is from Scott and it says, a fundamental question for wildlife photography, when is it good to stay in a good spot and wait for an animal to come free to you? Or when is it better to open up your opportunities by moving along and how do you I'm make not hearing stuff? James um, and Acacia, so I'm not sure if it's if it's on my end. Oh, there we go. Oh. I think you're back. Oh, okay, perfect. Can you hear me now? Um, can you hear me? There we go. Yeah, there we go. Okay, perfect. Case there or both of us. Yeah, okay. okay. The Carlton the Carlton internet here. <laughs> no worries. Um, so we have a question from Scott, and it's about the fundamental questions of wildlife photography. So when is it appropriate to stay in a good spot and wait, or to count your losses and move on your opportunities by moving along? So like, how do you make that decision of staying still or kind of keep moving to get that good shot? That's a really good question. I would say that that is that's so context specific. I mean, if... Um, uh, you know, if the weather is in your favor and it's the right time of year to, to see a subject, um, if, you know, you you think that you've got all those other variables in your favor, um, I would probably, especially if you have some prior knowledge that something that you're trying to target is in that location is nearby, I would probably just wait. Because then, you know, if you're, depending on what it is you're trying to photograph, <clears throat> you know, if it's like, a, you know, a bird or, or an ungulate of some sort, just you moving around the environment may, may spook them. So be quiet, be still, and hang out for a while. If it's something like, you know, plant, well, yeah, I, I'm assuming that you're probably not talking about plants, but I would just take, take stock in understanding what variables can put uh capturing a specific image in my favor and then i would just wait it out yeah that's what i would that's what i would do that's a that's a tough one perfect so we have another question many animals are uncooperative and won't hold still do you have any suggestions on getting photos quickly and somebody else asked a similar question so an example they use were butterfly they tend to jump and move and fly really fast so do you have any tips on yeah. animals that kind of don't let you get a good shot because they're not there for a long time. Yeah, yeah, um, I I do <laughs> because photographing fish underwater, they often move around very quickly, and it can be very challenging to get them. Um, if you have the capability of being able to crop, uh, if your if your camera, even modern phones, have quite high megapixel counts. Um, a lot of, you know, modern DSLRs, even some of the more entry level ones have good high megapixel counts. Um, don't be afraid to, to use like a bit of more of like a wide angle setting and then crop in later, just make it as forgiving as possible for yourself. That way you're not like trying to use a, a long telephoto lens or something to, to follow a butterfly that's moving around fairly randomly. And you're, you're, you know, you're, you're making yourself dizzy trying to follow the, the, the subject, take a little more of a wide angle um, view of it. And that gives yourself some more flexibility for moving around and following it a little easier. And then worry later about cropping in to, uh, to, to get the image that you need. Um, taking as many photos as you can, putting your, you know, your camera in burst mode. Um, if you're using a DSLR or another camera where you have a memory card, um, or you're using a memory card, uh, trying to get a memory card that, that is rated for a fairly high processing speed that will allow you to take lots of pictures really quickly. And the camera won't bog down in having to process all that, uh, the data from those images. So. Yeah. Yep. Great advice. So we have another question. Can you comment on the use of flash and its impact on the subject and when we should be conscious about that and when we should and shouldn't use flash? Yeah, that's that's a that's a really good question. Um I would I would say use common sense. And if and I would also follow your gut. If it doesn't feel right, then then don't then don't do it. Um, it's sort of similar along the lines of like, how close do you get to an animal before, you know, needing to go, okay, 
I really need to step back because this thing seems like it's giving me cues that it doesn't want me around. Um, there are certainly some uh, some animals that will respond fairly negatively to uh, bright white lights. So there are like some uh, turtle photographers, particularly with like hatchlings, um, I know that will use red light sources to photograph them. Um, other things at night might be a little more uh, bothered by bright white light sources. I would worry, I think, less about it during the day when there's, you know, the sun is like another really strong competing light source. Um, it's when you're in a situation where the only light source might be your flash that um, that might be potentially problematic. Um, I don't know. I'm not super clear on the science around some of this, and I think it's very species dependent and pretty context dependent. Um, but yeah, I would just, yeah, I would, I would listen to your gut, um, take a look online and see what, what other, you know, there may be some scientific studies that have examined this before, you know, the flash from a, a camera while it's, while it's very bright, doesn't last very long. It's not like taking a really, really bright field light that's a continuous light source and just suddenly flooding a habitat with that image, I, with that light, I would probably steer away from doing that and, um, and just focus on more using, if you're going to use a white light source, make sure it's, it's, it's a flash of light. And if you can try and turn down the, the, the flash power. So when I use flash at night with, with fish, I will turn down the light power as much as I can by by uh, compensating by cranking up the ISO on my camera uh, to make my camera a little bit more sensitive to light. So doing things like that could help. Perfect. So we have time for one more question. And one of the users wanted to know is, is there a recommended nature photography guide that you recommend for people who are looking to expand in their photography skills and kind of tips and tricks that they can take with them on the go while they're in the field? Um, that's a really, that's a really good, that's a really good question. Um, I have many books at home and I'm looking here in my office. I don't have any in my office here. Um, I don't remember some of the names of those publications, but um, you know, uh, Moose Peterson comes to mind as a, as a great nature photographer. His, some of his books were some of the earliest ones that I've, that I've read. Um, honestly, one of the best resources that, that I go to these days is the Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition. They give you a fair, a decent amount of information on um, how images were captured, what settings were used, things like that. But what I do is I really study the images and why they're so impactful. And then also reading the judges' comments too. Um, that can be really helpful for going, wow, okay, that's why that image speaks to me so much. Or, you know, that is what a world-class image looks like. Um, so I really enjoy spending time looking at the different images in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition. It doesn't necessarily lay it out like, here's what you should do. Um, but it does give me significant inspiration uh, and ideas for improving my own photography. So that's good. That's a really good question. Perfect. So I think that's all we have time for now. Yeah. So I just want to thank you, Sean, for that really awesome presentation. I, uh, I'm going to go back and view the recording because as we're trying to answer some questions during and, uh, and compiling them after, I, I'm, I want to make sure I uh, pick up a, on a couple of those things that you talked about. So that's really helpful. And I encourage others to, that we you can do the same. I did put the link in to where the recording will be. And anybody who's on this will actually get an email too after the wire afterwards following up with a link to that. So um, for anything you might've missed, um, you can go back and check that out. Um, I've definitely learned a lot and, uh, and yeah, found it super engaging and, and uh, very insightful. So thank you so much, Sean. And thank you everybody else for uh, attending and being a part of this. And um, I wish you a good rest of your day. Likewise. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone.